Good evening, everyone. This is going to be the next set of notes from the class I am in, and it's all about strain selection for the usage of microbes in commercial settings and research, too. So this is going to be involving the improvement of strains, trying to find the best strains that will give the highest amount of products. So you'll need to look at gene dosage, and you're also going to need desirable strains that have um, shorter growth times, no pigments produced, and less foam in these settings. All right, the first slide that we actually need to look at, and it has some numbers on it, so those are going to be fun to try and remember, um, the mutation rate. So in usual settings, they have spontaneous mutation. The bacteria will have um, 10 to the negative 10th to 10 to the negative fifth mutations per generation and per gene. However, when we add a mutagenic agent, this is going to increase that rate from 10 to the negative five to 10 to the negative three. So we have a higher chance of mutants. We have oxytrophs, which are a mutant strain that requires a growth factor. Or we also have phototrophs, not phototrophs, sorry about that, Prototrophs, so let me get the word correctly here. This is a microbe that does not require a growth factor, aka it's known as the wild type. A chromosome mutation could be one of these types of mutations that um, occur. We have a change in the number of chromosomes. That's kind of self-explanatory. A point mutation is a change in a single base where we could have a transition, which is a purine to another purine, or a transversion, which is a pyrimidine to a purine. So transition, purine to purine. Transversion, pyrimidine to purine. These could actually revert. So point mutations, these revert. A frame shift mutation, however, is when one or more nucleotides are added or deleted. Okay, so the mechanisms of mutagens include radiation. We have short wavelength UV, which is going to be about 254 nanometers. This number right here, that's going to be short again. And it's going to create some thymine-thymine dimers or thymine cytosine dimers. They're all going to be dimers. Um, cytosine, cytosine as well. And you could also have GC to AT transversions. Remember, we talked about transversions. That's a purine to a pyridine. To increase the frequency of the um, mutation, we could have the inactivation, photoreactivation, excision repair. And that's going to um, increase mutants. This has the manipulations in long wavelength visible light at um, 600 nanometers. That will um, increase the frequency of mutation. Or we could also use inhibitors of um, repair inhibitors, such as caffeine. Caffeine actually seems to increase the frequency of mutation because it inhibits those repair mechanisms. Long wavelength is going to be less mutagenic, but you might need to add dyes to increase the mutation rates. We also have the ionizing radiation. This is going to be like X-rays, gamma rays, or beta rays. Let me add that in. And gamma. So. Okay, so we can have single-stranded um, breaks which are repaired by nucleotide excision. Exclusion is written in this slide the professor gave. I think that might be a typo. Or double-stranded breaks, which could result in major structural changes. And these also include uh, translocations or inversions. Mostly UV and mutagens are used, so we don't really see this often. We see long UV or short UV at 254 nanometers. All right, let's go to some chemical mutagens now. Base analogs are the main one that the professor wants us to focus on. They're going to affect um, replicating DNA.
what do we mean by this? So we have, usually we have thymine. They're very similar to bases. So usually we have thymine. However, um, we could have this 5-bromouracil molecule. It's very similar to thymine. So it could actually um, have different binding. So the keto form will pair with adenine. The enol form with guanine. So Ka basically with 5 bromouracil. We also have 2 aminopurine. This could be replaced um, for A or adenine. This is what adenine gets replaced with sometimes 2 aminopurine. This commonly pairs with thymine, or it could also pair with cytosine as a guanine um, analog. So for that one, we have either C or T. For the 5 bromouracil, we have a keto with A or enol with G. More um, mutagens are chemicals. We have the frame shift mutagens. These are going to be, um, they're going to intercalate into the DNA, causing additions or deletions of bases. And we're, of course, going to have that shift in the reading frame, and we're going to just result in a non-functioning protein when that um, genetic code is read. It's also going to be shortened. The most commonly used is acridine orange. So that's the chemical mutagen for frame shifts. These are going to be useful in research, not um, developing strains at all. So we need these for research, frame shift mutagens. We also have something called commutation. We're going to be using this molecule here, NTG. It causes multiple mutations at the replication point through affecting polymerase. When a mutation is induced at a specific area or locus, a large number of further mutations can be found in the closely linked gene. So it's kind of like a ripple effect. And now you could select the mutants through reversion of an oxytrophic mutant where the mutations are close to selective marker. So you're going to, again, that means you're going to select by the organisms who can revert from oxo to prototroph. So remember, the bacteria have a way of correcting themselves sometimes. We could optimize um, mutagenesis. We could um, have these altered phenotypical characters be selected upon by the base sequence of the gene. We could... Um, know these hot spots so the high frequency of mutations will occur at these hot spots different mutagens of course create different hot spots at different sites the repair mechanisms of the cell if repair mechanisms um, are partially defective the cells may be killed without producing mutants so specific we need specific mutagens some of them may be ineffective in producing mutants, unfortunately. Some gene activity will be lost due to a mutation, and it might be partially restored due to a second one. This is called a suppressor mutation. It could be intertrogenic or intergenic, which is elsewhere in the genome, or again, intragenic, that means within the same gene. So a suppressor mutation, just to reiterate, gene activity that is lost due to the mutation that has been partially restored by a second one. All right, let's look at the dose response curve. So you're going to find the concentration with enough mutants. Mutagens usually cause a lot of cell death as well as mutations. So mutants are sought from the surviving cells. So, um, after strong treatment at a high concentration, which is written right here. Mutations can only be assessed through quantitative or qualitative means. So you need to um, go and if you're using an antibiotic, this would be the amount produced by a mutant. Okay. 
All right, so screening and selection, the difference in between those two terms. So screening is when you're going to examine one at a time for traits. This is like using the um, hydrolysis medium or looking for the organism's ability to hydrolyze a substrate. However, selection, this means only cells with certain properties are allowed to grow out of a population of millions. So an example would be the antibiotic plates. Only cells that contain a plasmid with the antibiotic resistance gene could grow on antibiotic containing plates. Selection is more efficient in screening as larger numbers of cells can be examined. So this one's more efficient. Take a little star. Alrighty, and the next part, the isolation of um, oxytrophs. So you could use filtration enrichment. So after mutagenesis, the spores of the filamentous organisms, I have streptomyces as the example, are going to be um, cultured in liquid minimal medium. So say that five times fast. Then you are going to separate the organisms, like the oxytrophs from the prototrophs by filtration, the prototrophs are going to be stuck on the filter because they grow in large masses. They're the wild type, so they're okay with being grown on the um, minimal medium that doesn't have, like, I guess, a special ingredient that the oxytrophs might need. So the phototroph, the prototrophs, sorry, the prototrophs are going to stay on the filter. They're going to grow in large masses. Oxytrophs, however, are going to pass through the filtrate. And... You place it on the oxytroph specific medium after that. And this specific medium, of course, has a supplement that the oxytroph actually needs. All right, and that's it on strain selection. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please do something nice for someone.